For many people, myself included, who've lived in Birmingham and the Black Country for most or all of their lives, the River Tame is forgotten. Why is that? The River Ray was Birmingham's river when Birmingham was a small town, whereas the Tame was in the north of Birmingham and in the outlying villages. So Birmingham grew out to meet it. The Black Country seemed to know more about it than Brummies do because it goes through quite a lot of Greenland, so it's the sort of places that people will go to, whereas in Birmingham it goes under the M6, so it's quite dark, it's concrete, it's not particularly a pleasant walk out with the family. When is it first referred to in documents or on maps? There's some old maps of Aston from the very early 1700s, which is the first picture evidence I found of the Tame. There are documents relating to mills along the river, which I found dating back to the 1300s. I would have thought mills probably was existing before then, but that's the earliest written evidence. Was it a source of drinking water for the area? There's no evidence that it was hugely used for drinking water until the early 1800s when Birmingham City Council, obviously before it was called Birmingham City Council, decided that they were going to use the River Tame and one of its inlets called Hawthorne Brook to deliver drinking water to Birmingham. So they created great big reservoirs which still exist in Whitton Way and Aston. That was in about the 1820s, and by the 1840s they realised the water was so polluted that this was not going to work very well, so had to find other sources which they eventually found in Wales. So in the 19th century, when industrialisation really came to the banks of the River Tame, what effect did it have on the river? At one point it was thought of as Britain's most polluted river, as well as the industry, you've got all the people who are working in the industry, so all their sewage is going into the river. And then World War One happened and industrial manufacturing stepped up a notch. After World War One, an organisation was set up to start changing the amount of pollution and fines were issued if companies were putting too much pollution into the river. Today, it's not perfect, but the turnaround is pretty amazing. There's lots of wildlife. There are herons. I've seen kingfishers in some of the biggest industrial areas of Birmingham. So there's obviously fish. Where do we first find the river? Well, there's technically two river Thames. One of the rivers comes up in Willenhall, but that doesn't have as much of a claim on the name because it was originally called the Willenhall Brook. The other river Thames seems to have always been called Tame. So it rises somewhere in Oldbury, and that's the river that we looked at. And of course, a lot of it's been built on. So much of it is underground now that it's really difficult to find. Oldbury was the first place we looked at because of the chemical industries there, and that really impacted the river. You've got Albright and Wilson who produce phosphorus for matches. During World War I, for example, Chance and Hunt produced mustard gas. They also produced something called pudding bombs, which were thrown to tear apart the barbed wire and all sorts of other chemicals. It had a very detrimental effect. You've got things like Blue Billy, which was a byproduct of a lot of the chemical manufacture. Great big mounds of it built up, and of course it washed into the river, turning it yellow and making it smell of eggs. And the river actually seems to be a bit of a rainbow, because as you go further along, you hear tales of the different colours that it used to be. In Wensbury, it was often called the Black Brook. When you go to Witton in North Birmingham, people say that the river was turquoise. In the Black Country, again, at Darleston and at Bescott, it's bright orange because of all the copper works there, and that's flowing in. And there are people who say that as the three rivers come in at Bescott, they would often come in three different colours and merge together because of the different industries along each of the routes. So as we move further down the river, after Oldbury, where do we move towards? You move towards Sheep Wash next. Uh, Around the area there are lots of brickworks. So Sheep Wash Nature Reserve is a remnant of the brickworks. There's a large lake and that was one of the mile pits where the clay was dug out from. 
And of course, brickworks needed water and they used the water from the river. So you've got Hamblet's brickworks who were famous for the black country blue bricks, which of course have got lots of iron in them. So they're very strong. So they're good for using in the manufactories. But also you've got fire bricks being made. So they are being used in the furnaces. It was really important for the area that there was lots of clay there and it made it much easier for all the furnaces to be built because it wasn't so far to ship the bricks from. So now it's a nature reserve. That's a triumph considering what you were saying about how polluted the water was. Yeah, there's lots of these little places along the river that are very unexpected. Obviously, sheep wash is supposed to be a nature reserve. It's been built Uh, specifically so that it attracts wildlife but as you go along the river a lot of the places are in between manufacturers or underneath bridges that you can't get to unless you're very adept so of course they're left alone so when you do get down to them they're very overgrown but they are filled with wildlife and from sheep wash what's next Next, we get to Wensbury Bridge. The river, because it was the border of Wensbury, flows round the edge, so the town grew out towards the river. But what it was used for was for mills. And, for example, in the late 1700s, there were four iron forges in Wensbury, and three of them were water-powered. The fourth one was horse-powered. So it shows how important the river was for the iron industry in Wensbury, which was a, a large part of its industrial development. And you've got Wensbury Bridge, which had a forge on it, and that was hammering metal, producing a new kind of iron, which was used in the gun barrels. There was Wensbury Forge, which was a bit further up. And again, they were really important in developing the gun trade in Wensbury. So they rolled the metal, and then when the barrels of the guns were forged, they'd grind them. It was then taken over by someone called Edward Elwell, who was very famous within Wensbury. He took over and started making tools, originally edge tools, so sharp tools, but eventually he started making spades and things like shovels. And it was a huge site. It was recently knocked down and excavated, and they found the old wooden water wheels that were used in the 1500s or remnants of them. To power these mills, they must have created a lot of divergences from the river. Yes, there were lots of mill races produced. And of course, there were arguments between different mills, because as you divert the river, you create a mill pool, which stops the water uh, to some degree, because you want to use it for your own mill. So you get lots of people complaining that the mill just further upstream is using all the water and it's not getting down to you. But of course, as the river got more polluted, this became a problem. So further downstream at Bromford Mill, there was so much sewage building up in the mill pool that they weren't able to use the water to power the mill because it was completely filling the area and the banks. So they were basically having to shovel out all the disgustingness onto the banks, which then kept sliding back in every time it rained. So it wasn't pleasant. And after Wensbury, the river crosses the boundary into Birmingham? Yes, the river flows into Perry Bar and then into Holford and Whitton. Holford is a very old part of North Birmingham. It's where the Romans crossed the River Tame, and the hull from Holford means water meadow, so there was farming using the water, and it's possible that there was some kind of Roman settlement near the river as well. There was also Holford Mill, And this was at one point used by Matthew Bolton in rolling metal. So it's very important in the wider history of Birmingham's industry. But later it was taken over by an ammunition factory, which was opened by George Kynock, who had worked at a factory in Birmingham. At the time, ammunition obviously sometimes exploded unexpectedly. And when the factory was in built-up areas such as Birmingham, this was not desirable. 
So they decided to move the factory out to somewhere a bit greener where there was going to be less trouble if explosions happened. And initially he had two sheds and 12 girls that worked for him. And one of the sheds was actually wheeled out from the centre of Birmingham to the new site. So from very small beginnings grew probably one of Britain's biggest ammunition factories. It also grew to produce all kinds of other objects, such as bicycles. There was also something called the Kynic Press there, which was a printing press and was very well known for producing books and industrial material. From here, does the Thame flow through Aston? It was very much part of the original ancient village of Aston. There was a huge serpentine arm that came round, but... In the early 1800s, when the railway cut through, it cut that arm off, which still existed for quite a long time. And people used to come out from Birmingham and boat on the Serpentine as a pleasure activity. And it was filled in, and then it became the Serpentine ground where the Onion Fair was held. But today, it has been straightened. So it comes under Electric Bridge and this is where the motorway comes into play. So you have the Aston Expressway and the Aston Expressway, Spaghetti Junction, the M6 were all built specifically over the river because it was an easy route because it wasn't built on. And so the river at this point is plunged into darkness But the whole area was really interesting industrially. You've got the very large GEC, the General Electric Company, initially not particularly successful. But in World War I, its fortunes changed as it had something called the Carbon Works, which made carbon for searchlights and batteries and things like that, which was obviously really important within the war effort. And it made such a large amount of money during World War I that in the 1920s it built a very grand Egyptian-style building which still stands today. And it built power stations, fridges, cookers, all kinds of different things and became a very large company. Also the Carbon Works made something called Lamp Black, which is used in tyre making, which during the First World War was taken up to Dunlop by horse and cart to be used in the tyres. So there was a real connection between all the industries in the area as well. Dunlop used the River Tame in making those tyres. So the road, the river, the canal and the railway all came together at what we now call Spaghetti Junction. Yes, it was very much a central hub for transport. You've got obviously the roads coming through serving and then in the late 1700s the canals are built and you've got Salford Junction where three canals come together which is absolutely fascinating and beneath Spaghetti Junction which is our modern road network and of course in its own way a triumph of engineering. The river was never really used for transport, it's wide enough but not quite deep enough and of course the railway comes through nearby as well and as you walk along the river today you feel those layers canals go on top of each other so you've got the aqueduct of one canal going over another canal going over the river with spaghetti junction above it's almost like a cathedral to modern transport when you go underneath but in history it wasn't called spaghetti junction what was it well, well, the formal name for Spaghetti Junction is the Gravelly Hill Interchange. So you've obviously got Gravelly Hill nearby, but there was also Salford as well. And Salford, again, you can tell by the ford, was an important crossing. And Sal, a lot of people think that it means caves because there were caves nearby. So this was the crossing by the caves. But the reason why there was a crossing here was because of the gravel. You didn't get your wheels caught in the mud. And then in the early 1800s, they moved the crossing point a bit further up to where Salford Bridge is and where Salford Junction is. Are there any signs of the caves? If they still exist, they're underneath Spaghetti Junction. But they were called the dwarf holes and they were man-made holes made into the very soft sandstone that's in the area. There's some photographs of them that were taken in the late 1800s, but of course, because photography wasn't that great, they're very dark, so you can't really see what they looked like. But we do know that they were used to shelter in in the Second World War because the whole area was really targeted because of all the industries, so they were used as air raid shelters. 
Where does the river now go? After Spaghetti Junction, the river travels under the M6 and it goes for about three miles together on and off. The river does still meander a little bit, whereas the motorway doesn't. But it's the longest viaduct in the country. It's about three miles long. So you follow the concrete, you follow the motorway, you find the river. Recently, because HS2 is going to be coming through that way, a lot of it's been cordoned off and you can't get to the river as much as you used to. You can follow the canal as well down to Bromford, which is another really old part of Birmingham, which not many people know about. There was a forge there that was powered by the river called Bromford Forge that was run by the Jennings family, who were a very wealthy Birmingham family, and they were working in the iron trade. Bromford Forge was originally a rolling mill, rolling metal, and then later in the 19th century, it started drawing wire, originally powered by the water and then taken over by steam engines. And around that area, there was all kinds of industries. There was Aston Chain and Hook, and there's one that still survives on the river, obviously not water-powered, hemp-hill castings, which make aluminium and other metal castings, very much in the way that it's been done for hundreds of years. So as the river flows down, it flows into Castle Bromwich and Castle Vale, which was a hub of all kinds of industries in transport. So you have the airfield that was built just before World War I and was used during that period, not really in the war effort, but there was manufacture of aeroplanes. This really increased, obviously, during World War II, and then it was taken over later by Jaguar. So the Jaguar that still is there today is the site where all the aeroplanes were built. You had things like Vickers, Walsley Motors that made Morris Minor engines, They also made military vehicles during World War II. You had Leyland Daff. You had people building the train carriages. So it really was a site of planes, trains and automobiles. Then you have this ancient bit of the river here where there was a Mott and Bailey Castle, which is why it's called Castle Bromage. And the castle marked this important crossing point. But the Mott still exists, which a lot of people don't realise because it's an embankment of the M6. But you can actually see where the Mott of the castle once was as you wander around along the river. So from Albury to Castle Bromage, it almost seems as if we've cut a cross-section through the industrial history and the industrial archaeology. It is like a cross-section of Birmingham and black country history. The river brings it together as a story of how all these different industries interacted with each other. It's a way of telling it that perhaps hasn't been told before from the perspective of the river, if you like, how it saw the industry developing along its banks throughout its life. And to anyone who thinks, well, this would be an interesting place to visit, what would your advice be? There are definitely places you can go. There are the sort of well-known places like Sandwell Valley and Kingsbury Water Park, which are very green. But if you're interested in the industrial history, I really would suggest going underneath Spaghetti Junction. It's all public access. You can get to it. Um, You might need a good map, but you can walk along the canals and you can see the river underneath there if you go to Bescott station and if you cross through the car park you can find the river you can actually walk all the way along the river to Tame Parkway station and that's where Wensbury Forge was so you can walk along the river into Wensbury there's occasions where you have to move away but you can follow it for most of the way through Wensbury and where can I learn more about the river and your project we have a website which is tame past present future or one word dot org dot uk and we also have a blog as well which is industrial river tame dot blogspot dot co dot uk they've got all information about what i've been talking about plus more and maps of the area so you can get a general idea of how the river flows through all these different areas and find out about the industrial history and also lots and lots of photographs of the river, how it looks today, as well as some historical photographs that we found in the archive. And what do you think is the future of the river? I think it's getting less polluted. There's a lot more wildlife. The Environment Agency have an interest in the river now. I think what needs to happen is that it needs to be opened up for people to walk along 
and there needs to be more understanding of how to get down to the river and how you can follow it. Jenny, thank you very much indeed for taking us on a really interesting trip. Thank you for having me. Thank you.